Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Unpacking Possibility. I'm your host, Tracy Stein. As always, I'm so happy to be here with you. Today's guest is Dr. Beth S. Brodsky. She's a clinical psychologist and a noted researcher on suicide risk prevention and dialectical behavior therapy, otherwise known as DBT. Now, if DBT sounds familiar to you, it may be because Oprah and Oprah Magazine have recently talked about DBT and its usefulness as an effective therapy for a range of challenging conditions. Also, Lady Gaga has been very frank about her own struggles and earlier significant trauma and how DBT has been especially helpful for her. Now, a little bit about Beth. Dr. Brodsky, she's an associate clinical professor of medical psychology in psychiatry at Columbia University, and she's the interim co-director of the Suicide Prevention Training Implementation and Evaluation Program at the Center for Practice Innovations at New York State Psychiatric Institute. She's very well published. She has a book out that you may want to check out, and she talks about suicidal risk treatment of suicidal behavior in borderline personality disorder and in general. She's an excellent educator and has trained a number of people in the use of DBT, including me. When I was a trainee at Columbia University Medical Center and New York State Psychiatric Institute many years ago now, um, Beth is a really warm and thoughtful person an excellent clinician, and a really excellent educator and researcher. And I think what our conversation today will do is clarify what dialectical behavior therapy is and what it can do, who it can help, and, and why the skills of DBT are actually something that anybody would benefit from, regardless of whether or not they carry a formal clinical diagnosis. So I hope you enjoy the interview. You'll be able to find out more about Beth and how to get in touch with her or find out about um, ongoing clinical trials and so forth in the show notes. But without further ado, let's get to the interview. And of course, as always, if you enjoy the interview, please remember to like, share, and subscribe. It really helps me continue bringing good content to you. So Beth, welcome to the podcast. I'm so happy to have you here. It's so great to see you. You are really um, a a very well-known expert in dialectical behavior therapy and suicide prevention. Um, And I'm so excited for you to talk with us today about what DBT is, who it can be helpful for, um, and, and, and just share a lot of the, you know, again, the wealth of knowledge that you have about managing difficult emotions and working with people or, you know, relating to people in our lives who have some of the challenges that DBT is really helpful for. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Tracy, for having me. It's great to see you too. And I'm really glad to have the opportunity to share about uh, DBT and how to um, think about and approach people who struggle with emotional dysregulation and interpersonal uh, difficulties. So thanks. Um, So I was very grateful to learn about dialectical behavior therapy as a young uh, psychologist, clinical psychologist, because I was interested in helping people who uh, have these emotional dysregulation problems, who engage in self-harm behaviors, and who experience some interpersonal difficulties that make it extra hard for them to get the compassion and understanding that they really need. Um, and DBT, dialectical behavior therapy, found gave me a way as a, clinic, a clinician to um, think about and help people and understand what was going on. Um, and I really feel like it can be very helpful in that regard. You know, when people with these issues come for treatment, to have a clinician, a therapist who is trained to understand and have compassion for them, which is not so common. I think uh, dialectical behavior therapy really opened the field for the healthcare providers to be able to provide help in a way that made it easier for people to get the help um, and use the help. And so dialectical behavior therapy is a form of cognitive behavior therapy that was developed by Dr. Marsha Linehan, who was very interested in helping people reduce their suicidal behaviors. That was her first main interest. Um, She noticed that uh, there were people who were engaging in a lot of chronic self-harm behaviors, um, had a lot of suicidal ideation, a lot of the time living with thoughts of wanting to die. And 
she really wanted to target that particular um, symptom or behavior. And she found that if you try to just apply a behavioral approach uh, to behavior, which made sense in her mind, she found that it was not very acceptable to people, that they didn't take to it. Um, and that was because she realized that you can't just ask people to change their behavior. You have to try to really understand why they're engaging in the behavior and even helping them to understand why they're engaging in the behavior. So that's where that idea of dialectics comes from, that you're looking at behaviors and saying people who are engaging in these behaviors, they need to change their behaviors because they're causing them a lot of pain and distress in their life. And at the same time, you have to look at the opposite idea that these behaviors are serving some kind of purpose and they make sense for the person. It helps them to deal with their emotional pain in the moment. And so those are two opposite ideas that we have to synthesize together. That's what dialectics is about. It's about synthesizing opposites into a larger worldview that contains both of those opposites. Um, so the whole treatment is designed to give people skills and new ways of thinking about how to um, change their behavior, also to learn how to regulate their emotions because a lot of the behavior is driven by a lot of emotional distress that's caused by not being able to control your emotional response, having a very intense emotional response to things that happen to you. Uh, sometimes that's a biological thing that you're born with. Um, it also becomes a very physiological arousal that when you have an emotion, it's not just an emotion, but it becomes like a body state. And so sometimes that's why self-harm behavior is a solution because it helps calm the body down, for example. So dialectical behavior therapy, DBT, targets the emotional dysregulation, gives people skills for learning how to regulate their emotions in ways that are more skillful than just self-harming. Um, and it provides both the people who are engaging with the person and the person themselves with a way of thinking about the meaning of the behavior, how what the behavior is helping them to do, how it's causing them problems and giving them the chance to say, okay, I don't feel judged. I don't feel being told that I have to change and I'm bad because I'm doing these things. And I also, it, it gives people hope that they can actually do it. Because I think another reason people don't like to be told they need to change is because they say, I don't know how, right? I just don't know how. So when you just want to say you have to change, it can feel criti critical and invalidating. And it can also feel impossible. So DBT tries to um, take away the blame and the um, feeling that you're being told that you're not good because you're engaging in this behavior and saying, well, it makes sense that you're engaging in this behavior. You experience your emotions very intensely. Your body gets aroused. It starts to lead to this unbearable feeling of tension. And sometimes the only way you know how to uh, help yourself feel better is to engage in a self-harm behavior. That's a different kind of approach, I think. You know, I'm thinking from the point of view of people who are listening today, some of whom may really not be familiar with you know the way we might describe some of what um, somebody would come in with as a problem, like emotional dysregulation, and so I you know I want to kind of paint a picture. Um, you know, somebody who feels like they can feel fine one moment, and then their emotion, their their distress, or their frustration, or their anger, or their feeling criticized. It's not that everybody doesn't experience those emotions, but it's that it can feel like zero to 60 in like a second. Right. It can feel like almost like the emotion, almost like its own entity doing the action. Yeah. You know, and I've kind of framed it, you know, for people, you know, even who don't have a clinical diagnosis, but who are dealing with intense emotions in the moment, it's like having a hot potato inside of you. And it's like, it's so painful that you just want to lob it, you know, and later there's this big mess to clean up that can be really difficult to clean up easily. Yes. And so um, 
the kind of people that DBT was originally developed for do have that kind of intense ex emotional experience where the emotions take over in such a way that they lose access to the kinds of problem solving that they are actually very capable of when they're not so emotionally aroused. Um, and so it's a very different shifting feeling of sense of self. Uh, you either feel in control and I'm problem solving and I'm figuring and I'm taking one step after the other to get on with my life. And then all of a sudden an emotional trigger happens and it's like a tidal wave that just takes over the whole mind and body and then leading to these behaviors, whether they're interpersonal behaviors or self-destructive behaviors or impulsive, you know, behaviors, you know, doing things against the law or um, that really interfere with their life. You know, that in the moment, the emotion is saying, I need to just do this thing to feel better. And then the thing that I do to feel better creates, you know, a rupture in my relationships or, you know, self-harm that I've done to myself or a problem in my work or, or life setting. And so people who DBT was designed for have that kind of emotional dysregulation. It was, you know, made for people who were diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, which is characterized by this, these different areas of dysregulation in emotion, in interpersonal functioning and behavior, and also in ability to think straight, right? Cognitive. So um, you don't have to have the full diagnosis in order to get benefit from DBT. And in some ways, I really like that DBT doesn't call focus so much on the name of this disorder, but more about the dysregulation. You know, that's really uh, what we're trying to target with the treatment is how to feel more in control of your mind, feelings, and behaviors. That's really what it's about. It's something that so many people can relate to wanting to have a more skillful way of relating to themselves, of processing thoughts and feelings related to something outside of them or what they imagine is outside of them. I imagine somebody's thinking this of me and the reason they didn't call back is because they don't like me and now I'm getting really upset and something can escalate and we're giving them tools to observe from a place of healthy detachment and to have different options for acting in the moment or for delaying acting. You know, the other thing that you alluded to is that DBT is really not so focused on pathologizing the person, right. looking for everything that's wrong and then just leaving them with that, which, you know, nobody would feel good with that. You know, well, you've got all these things that you're doing poorly and, you know, just stop. You and know. people leave treatment, right? People don't want to hang around for that, right? They feel worse instead right. of better. Mm -hmm. It's such a, um, a compassionate and self-compassionate approach. And again, you also alluded to this. It doesn't, it's not compassion, which means like whatever you do is fine, which is a misunderstanding of compassion. Right. It, it's helping somebody to take a look at things that are difficult to look at but in a way that gives them a skill set and, and hope. And, you know, because I'm thinking of how often I've had to explain to someone, you know, all the tools people have, and it doesn't even have to be just um, borderline personality specific, right? It could be, you know, somebody's smoking or somebody's overeating or somebody is, um, you know, I'm trying to think some other. Um, Over-personalizing interaction yeah. with people. That's very common, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We're just not having communication skills that are as helpful, mm -hmm. right? Because they want people to know what they need and want, but don't know how to express that effectively. Yes. And what I try and remind people is that, you know, we all have these tools that we've learned to use because they've done something for us. We wouldn't use them if they never did anything. But as we grow and, and develop and mature and the situations change, we require a bigger toolbox with better tools, maybe. Right. They're not working for us anymore, right? And yeah. usually they work in a short-term kind of way, not long-term. So there's a difference between what works for you short-term 
versus what works for you long term. And I think that's a big focus of this approach as well is to say, yeah, well, in the moment, eating something, you know, that tastes really good um, will make you feel better. But then later you feel that you ate too much, that you're afraid that you were not healthy, you gained weight, whatever it is, you know, the feeling that you have after you binge, for example, during the binge, it feels very satisfying. There's something that's being relieved short term. And then there's the long term consequences. So it's how do you ride out those short term, the need for a short term um, solution to the distress that doesn't cause a longer term problem. And so the skills have to do with trying to tolerate the distress of that moment in a more skillful way. So true. And you just mentioned like somebody binging and actually DBT has been used for things in addition to borderline personality like binge eating disorder, bulimia. Talk about some of the other things that um, DBT has been used for effectively. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things about DBT is that it's called an evidence-based treatment for suicidal behavior and self-harm behavior, meaning that there have been studies shown that it's effective in reducing those behaviors. Um, And also there are studies that have an evidence base that provide evidence that it reduces eating disorder behavior as well, particularly binge eating and bulimia, a little less in terms of anorexia. Um, Some of the other clinical uses of DBT that don't have as much of that scientific uh, evidence base, you know, we haven't uh, really had studies that show proof that it is uh, good in reducing anxiety, depression, anger, other impulsive behaviors, uh, interpersonal disruptions and problems with people in your life. But clinically, DBT is being used for all of those things. And, you know, anecdotally, we can say that it's very helpful in the same way that it's helpful in reducing bulimia, binge eating, suicidal behaviors, that if you choose a target behavior like anger outbursts or interpersonal ruptures in your relationships, or some people have kleptomania and they steal things, or any of these other kinds of behaviors that, again, when you think about it, they're all done in order to provide a short-term relief, but long-term cause problems. So anything that is in that category, DBT is very useful for. Absolutely. I'm thinking even, you know, we talked a little bit or alluded to like, you know, drinking too much. Substance use, drinking. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming most people are not familiar with these kind of four components of DBT, these kind of four areas of focus. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about them and, and how they help. So I think you're talking about the four areas of dysregulation and the skills modules. Yes. Are, okay. Yes. So if you, we think about these issues, these problems that people come for help with as areas of dysregulation in emotions, behaviors, interpersonal and cognitive or thinking, those are four areas of dysregulation that DBT addresses directly. So once you engage somebody in the idea that these things, these problems are ways that you cope right now and they have served you to actually help you in certain moments in your life but they're not working for you anymore how can we help you develop better ways of coping so that you don't have to rely on these behaviors that are not skillful for you and how can we replace those with more skillful behaviors that will still help you ride out that period of distress without the longer term consequences, the negative consequences. And so there's a whole system of skills training in DBT that um, addresses those four areas. People who do the full DBT treatment, they have an individual therapist that they work with, and then they attend a DBT skills training group where they, and there's a book of all the skills with lots of work in sheets and homework assignments. And it's almost like taking a class where you learn with other people how to try to replace those unskillful behaviors with more skillful coping. And it starts with mindfulness skills. That's one of the first modules that people get introduced to. And that has to do with learning how to control your thinking and the cognitive dysregulation. Mindfulness practice, which comes from the Zen Buddhist tradition in DBT, gives people a way of learning how to control their mind a little bit more. And you learn how 
when you control your mind, you're able to better control your emotions and your behaviors and your interactions with other people. So the mindfulness skills are like the core area of skills training that everybody learns first. And it's ongoing throughout the treatment to keep practicing mindfulness, learning to notice when your mind goes somewhere where you didn't really choose for it to go and then saying, oh, wait a minute, let me just bring it back to where I choose it to be. Um, and it's almost like I use the metaphor using a bicep curl for the mind, you know, you strengthen this muscle of being able to notice when your mind is going somewhere that is not necessarily a good place for you to go. And then being able to have the strength to redirect to the present moment, uh, what's actually happening right now. And then once you are introduced to that concept of controlling your mind, then you're taught distress tolerance skills. How do you ride through an urge to binge eat, for example, and you don't want to. So what can you do instead? How can you distract yourself? How can you uh, reach out to other people? How can you do exercise? You know, there's lots of other things that you're invited to try when you're trying to fight an urge to engage in one of those unskillful behaviors. Those are the distress tolerance skills. Then there's the interpersonal skills. How do I uh, use mindfulness to identify what do I actually want to get in this interpersonal interaction? I want to ask somebody for something. I want to say no to something. I want to say no to somebody, but I want to keep goodwill with the other person. How do I do that? These skills invite you to say, I deserve to get what I want, which is something that a lot of people don't really come in believing. It empowers people to say, wait, I, I do deserve to get what I want, but I have to figure out how to best do that and to think about how I'm going to approach another person in order to get what I want, including keeping the relationship in good status and maintaining my self-respect as and well. I want to add, if the person is upset that you are setting a healthy no, a healthy limit, yeah, can you tolerate that? But yes. still respect yourself and respect the other person's right to have the feelings they're having, even though they don't feel good to you. Exactly. So one of the things that get in the way of good interpersonal functioning is this idea, a belief that's probably not a true belief that I can't stand it if the person gets mad at me. So if I can't stand it that the person gets mad at me, then I'm not going to be able to say no to them. But then that causes problems because everybody needs to be able to say no sometimes to an unwanted request. So then the dialectic approach is I'm allowed to say no, and the other person is allowed to be upset. And both of those things are true. Those are opposites that are both true. And once you understand that, you don't have to be so afraid of the person saying no or, or being upset that you said no. Uh, so I feel like half the population could use that skill. <laughs> that yeah, the interpersonal insanity. skills in particular, and none of us are really taught how to best, you know, uh, tolerate disagreement with other people, angry feelings. Anger is not in and of itself a, a bad emotion at all. Anger, that's the other thing. So then the emotion regulation skills come in about how to understand that every emotion has a function, including anger. People are so afraid of anger, but actually you need anger to be able to stand up to say, no, this is not right for me. You know, if I get angry when somebody does something, that tells me something. Um, so it's not that the anger itself is uh, difficult, it's the ability to regulate the anger and to use the anger to assert yourself, to say, hey, I don't like what you're doing, or I want this. That's different than having a big, you know, out of control, angry outburst. And so, so it's true. about understanding that all emotions have their value to helping you learn what you need, what you want, and to be able to motivate skillful behavior as long as you're in control of the emotional response. I think people get confused about emotions being bad because they experience them in this out of control, dysregulated way. And then it results in these out of control, dysregulated behaviors. So we, part of the emotion regulation skills is saying the behavior and the and the, the feeling and the behavior are two different things. They're not the same. They're related, 
but they're not the same thing. You have a feeling, you don't necessarily have to act on the feeling. And I'm just thinking as you're talking, you know, how many people who have trouble expressing anger, they either can't express it or they explode, got a lot of negative feedback about having emotions that other other people around them can't tolerate. And we'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes, but you, you made me think about that as you were talking about that, but there's so much that somebody's trying to manage in those yeah. moments. Well, part of it is even knowing that you're you're having you're angry because people have trouble even identifying how they're feeling, partly because as you were saying that maybe they were told that they shouldn't be feeling a certain way. That I don't feel angry about this. Why should you feel angry? <laughs> or you're not angry. <laughs> Oh, you're not angry, or you have no reason to be angry, or all those messages that you get um, that help that get in the way of the person being able to say, oh, no, wait, I know I'm angry. (laughs) That goes a long way to being able to control your emotion if you're able to name it and allow yourself to have it instead of trying to talk yourself out of it, which is a big part of, again, the, the DBT focus on emotion and validating your emotion that just because somebody else isn't angry about something. That doesn't mean I can't be angry about it. We're different. So mindfulness, distress, tolerance, emotion regulation. Interpersonal effectiveness. Those are the four areas of skills training in DBT that directly map onto those areas of dysregulation. So important. And again, like I, you know, I feel like I said this so many times, just generally, I can't think of anybody who wouldn't benefit from that. You know, because there's this idea that every, but, you know, ideally we would all have incredibly balanced, skillful people to learn from throughout life, especially earlier, early on. But, you know, the way people handle stress, the way people relate to other people or or solve conflict is something that generation to generation, it doesn't always change a ton. And it's not always super adaptive. What I really love about the DBT model is, you know, I think about some of my training, which was not DBT, where it was kind of like, well, somebody has these issues, they're going to be this way for life. They're really difficult, but, you know, almost kind of like, what can you do? (laughs) They're so resistant to change Um, or they have insight. Why aren't they changing? And I love that DBT is like, oh, this is why you're feeling this way. And these are things you can do. And somebody can see their own progress and learn to love and accept themselves in the moment. That's dialectic, right? Even though there are things they really must begin working on and changing. I think what you're alluding to is something that I use in my training a lot, Um, talking about treatment as usual. You know, before DBT came on the scene, we were all doing some form of therapy that was from psychodynamic uh, approach where um, it wasn't being, it wasn't targeting these areas of dysregulation so much. So people with these areas of dysregulation weren't responding to that, those kinds of treatments that didn't directly target them. And they were deemed as untreatable uh, because the treatment of the time was not addressing their issues, but they were being blamed for not responding to treatment. And so a lot of um, misconceptions about the untreatability of borderline personality disorder, emotional dysregulation, suicidal, chronic suicidal behavior and self-harm behaviors uh, and interpersonal difficulties, you know, you're untreatable because you don't respond to treatment. And not only that, people were not staying in treatment because they felt pathologized and blamed and it was painful. And so people didn't stay in treatment. Um, And so that was one of the big innovations of DBT was to make it focused on, well, wait a minute, maybe it's not the person, maybe it's the treatment. The treatment is not specific to this particular, these particular difficulties, and the treatment approach is not palatable. So we have to make it, we call it a a borderline specific treatment. And DBT was one of the first, but there are others. There's transference-focused psychotherapy and schema-focused therapy that more uh, take these other areas into account and they address dysregulation and the interpersonal difficulties and they take a more validating approach so that the person can stay engaged and not feel judged and pathologized. So the person stays in treatment and the treatment actually addresses the issues more directly. 
Well, it's 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 such an important point. I'm, I was just thinking as you were talking, like if a patient came in to a doctor's office and had, you know, one kind of illness, and you know, the doctor gives them medication that they don't respond to, <laughs> you wouldn't blame that person right. for your condition not responding to that medication. You'd say, well, what other options do we have? Exactly. And I feel like DBT really created that option. And it's a more appropriate option, I think. One other thing I would say is that uh, the treatment approach of DBT and these other borderline specific, for lack of a better term, <laughs> treatments is that it helps the therapist stay engaged. Because another yes. feature of this whole situation was that the therapist would say, you're not treatable and I'm not going to treat you anymore. So the therapist would get kind of burnt out because the therapist felt like they were trying everything they knew to help this person. And this person was not responding or even worse, the person was getting angry um, at the therapist and the therapist would get, have burnout. And so say, you know, this isn't working, let's just stop. And so again, you know, the innovations of DBT and other treatments like it is to say, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, we have to understand these things in a different way that helps us not get so burnt out. You know, we understand, we learn how to see progress in smaller increments. That's another thing that I think helps the therapist stay engaged and the client or the patient because it's not all or nothing. Again, this, uh, um, it's not a black and white approach. Oh, if you don't stop this behavior, that means you're not getting better. Well, it's hard to stop a behavior, but we started to see, oh, but you know what? You used a skill here this time. So we don't just focus on eliminating the behavior right away, but we also focus on you staying in treatment, you're working on this, you're trying skills. So we have a way of seeing progress even when you know, the main symptom is still not completely, you know, That's cured. such a good point that I think people, you know, often don't hear about enough. Yeah. Is that, you know, it's kind of like, you know, I use sometimes the metaphor of um, like, if you're going to run a marathon, it's kind of the same way as running a city block. It's like step by step. Exactly. You know, and it's not, you know, you're not going to get there for most people. <laughs> you're not going to get there in one day. For marathoners, maybe, but uh, <laughs> you're know, still not going to be like five minutes later, you're where you want to be or in a completely seamless way. And that's still okay. You have to be able to see more. Sh Again, this is the short term, long term. You have to see the progress in the short term, even if the longer term goal isn't met yet, that you have to build in incremental um, reinforcers or like, oh, wow, okay, I'm on the right path. Even if I'm not there yet, I'm on the path and I'm and I took a step forward. And that is a way to stay engaged and working towards a longer term goal is to break it up into shorter term achievements. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, Beth, related to that, because you just spoke about, you know, therapists being able to benefit from having tools at their disposal so that yes. they can do a better job. How can friends and family members and partners better support people who are in a DBT treatment or have some of the challenges that might prompt someone to seek DBT treatment. Yeah. So emotion dysregulation, impulsivity, so forth. Um, because I think what happens a lot of times is people, their own frustration builds they get up. Fed up. Yeah. 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 No, it's a great question. And, you know, sometimes I work with family members not you know, rather than the actual person who's struggling with those symptoms, but Again, teaching the skills and the dialectic synthesis between validation and change is great for family members as well. Everybody can benefit from the skills. And in fact, you know, adaptations for, of DBT for adolescent and children uh, populations require that the family uh, also go to the DBT skills group. So everybody's learning the skills together. So we can learn how to balance um, setting limits uh, with somebody with being compassionate about the pain that they're in. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we encourage family members and friends to understand that this person's behavior, as hurtful as it is to you, or how scary it is to you, is coming from a place of pain and a place of not having the ability to have access to skills. And one of the confusing 
things is that sometimes people do have access to skills. So that's when it gets really confusing for the people around because, wait a minute, I know that you can do that because I have seen you be very skillful in this in certain situations. So part of the education of the people around is to say, yes, part of the problem of the dysregulation is that sometimes people have access to their skills, but other times they do not. And it's not an intentional saying, I don't care, I know I can do this, but I'm not going to do this. It's really when they're in that emotional state where the emotion takes over that all the skills go out the window and they don't have access to those skills. So understanding that it's not an intentional, you know, I'm not, I'm refusing to use my skills right now. Not about that. They do have to learn how to access the skills, even in that state of mind. That's the goal, but that's the hard process of getting there. It's not overnight, but just understanding that it's not an intentional willfulness of saying, I, I don't care, I'm not using my skills. Even, even people will say that, but it's not really, that's not where it's coming from. I'm not in this headspace where I can't even know what that skill would be. Um, and so understanding validating whatever is valid um, in the person's behavior. Even if what they're doing is really not helpful, you can imagine that maybe they think it's gonna get the response that they want it to. Um, it's not easy for the people around, but I think it helps to have that way of thinking about it. I think it does help uh, calm things down. Yeah, absolutely. Beth, is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? Or anything else that you think we should cover today? I don't know. I think you uh, did a really good job of, point, of getting the main points out that what the therapy is, how it helps both the people struggling and the people who are helping, um, what it consists of, the challenges. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I'm not sure I can think of anything else to add. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, where can people learn more about your work or get your book? Oh, okay. Um, well, my book is on Amazon um, and it has a very <laughs> unappealing title called <laughs> The Dialectical Behavior Therapy Primer, How DBT Can Inform Clinical Practice. And it, it's mostly more of a text for clinicians, but I think there's a lot of information that's very helpful to consumers as well about what the therapy is and a lot of what we spoke about today, how it changes the way of looking and framing the behavior so that it makes much more sense and more matter of fact and non-judgmental. I have a website um, and in general, you can just Google my name and uh, you know I'm at Columbia, I have a web page there. Uh, so any of those things to find about my work. And also there's a lot of great DBT resources out there as well in general. Beth, so nice to see you. Thank you so much for coming on and talking about, um, you know, a, a mere fraction of all of the things that you know um, and your expertise, because there's an abundance of uh, good stuff, even in the little snippet we were able to cover today. Okay, well, thanks for uh, eliciting all of that out of me and, you know, getting it out there to uh, your audience. I'm very, it's fun and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. This has been another episode of Unpacking Possibility. Remember to like, share, and follow. And of course, as always, until next time, be well.